Hi, in this video I'm going to go through the questions from the week 4A, so that's Tuesday lesson on uh, for the year of 2023 fall semester. Uh, so beginning here, uh, around somewhere near 180 of the object attributes and extractions notes page, I'm creating a very convoluted list type object. Uh, inside of it, it's got many different types of data, which is like the whole thing that lists are able to do really well. And so I'm going to run this. Um, I could go through this uh, if I wanted to, but we're going to talk through most of it throughout this video. So I'm just going to run that and go from there. Um, the first question is which elements in EP list are named? Now again, I can just go through um, this code and probably figure this out. So for instance, this one was named, this one was named, this one was named, and this one was named. This did not have a name. There's no equal sign here. There's stuff inside, so that's inside the list, inside the list. And this one also did not have a name. It's just a vector. If I wanted to print that out, I should be able to see that fairly easily. This one does not have a name, it's just got a position. This one has a name, this one has a name, this one has a name indicated by the dollar sign, in other words. This one has a name, this one does not have a name, it's just calling it its number, its position within the underlying one-dimensional structure of a list type object. The next part said, do not descend into the object. And so the, the answer is those names. And it's really easy to just pull out that information. There are its names. Uh, so if I do that, and then I just say, I don't know, let's exclude things that had these values. So that, that worked. I could then use that to extract from the name. So if you really wanted like a code version of it, there you go. Next question, it said extract the eighth value. There it is, it's inside of this section. Um, so we can just start off there. So if I just get inside that container, this is what it looks like. Um, so extract the eighth value from EP list, utilize square brackets, done. Square brackets again, done. And then a comma, uh, sorry, square brackets with a comma. So that as a, is as opposed to doing something like this, which would have extracted that whole row, uh, returning a vector and then requiring me to use a vector type extraction. So that would have worked, but I asked you to do it at the same time. So at the same time, fourth row and second column, giving me the index position. The next one said the double square brackets to obtain the contents of the fifth element. Um, so let's just follow that. All right, there's the contents of the fifth element. Oh, that was it. Cool, done. <laughs> Use the double square brackets and index positions to extract just the first column from this data frame. So this one right here. Um, so I say double square brackets with a comma. So it's gonna be something like this. And index position, so that means I'm gonna add numbers, not the names or logical or something like that, uh, to extract just the first column from this data frame. Uh, so the first column is this one right here. So that's gonna correspond to after the comma. This would have been the first row if I put the one here. Uh, as it is, this is going to extract all rows because I've left this highlighted section blank. Ooh. I just forgot to change that to a five. There we are. Cool. Number five, use the element names to extract from the second column from the data frame in EP list. Uh, I'm guessing this had a name of some kind. Let's go find out. If, I, if I'm looking for element names, um, I can usually find them by scrolling through after typing in the dollar sign. Um, 
So if I run this, uh, I believe that's the fifth element. Yes, it is. Yes, it is me. Um, and then extract the second column from this data frame. Um, so I could use the dollar sign again. Um, and if that's the second column, because those are sorted in order typically, um, that worked. I also could have used a square bracket tool and typed in the letters, capitalization would matter, uh, that provide the name to that column. Um, uh, there's technically some other ways to do that. Uh, because these all data frames are lists, um, I can extract the same way that I could use the double square brackets. Um, so technically, one sec, yeah. Technically, this would work as well, I believe. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Uh, probably just a typo there. There it is. Yeah. So technically, those would all work, all using the element names. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next up, extract the caveat column using the names of elements. And it looks like I named, I left the answer in the, the key. So, oops. Um, but in a non-creepy context. So yeah, that was right. Good job, Nolan. Um, if you want to do it a different way, uh, you could use any of these methods um, that I've described above. So you would just replace who with caveat in each of those examples. Um, yeah. Uh, next was extract the characters Z, Y, and X. Um, and I, I even gave you an example of it in the opposite order of how it's probably listed. Um, but let's see, I say to use the dollar sign and square brackets. Um, it's probably more fun. Was it the second element? Yeah, it's the second element. It's underneath me. There it is. Wait, I got this. Right there. My finger keeps cutting off. There, ha, got it. Um, there was a Z, so Z was position choice. That was entirely unnecessary. Um, so if I extract the column or the container and then I type in 26, I can see Z. Uh, it would then be 25 and 24, since that's just the opposite order. There's a handy way to just create a range of whole values, and that's the col colon symbol. Here is a fun thing. People will often try to just use this for everything. Um, you're right. This does actually subset the uh, object to um, the container that holds these letters. But unfortunately, because it never goes inside of that container, it won't work um, because I'm not opening up the container. I'm just picking out that second one. And interestingly enough, if I try to go into the second one again, I get nothing because there is no longer a second container. At this point, there is now just one container, and, and then I could just keep going into infinity, um, and it would never go in. So um, to actually open this up, you would need to do something else. Uh, my recommendation is just to use the recursive um, extraction method, but I didn't say you could do that. Um, I told you a different recursive extraction method, which is the dollar sign. So that is accessing the contents. And then this is uh, subsetting the vector that results from this. Note the difference in how it prints to show you the clues needed to understand that that's a vector and no longer a list. So a little text up here telling you the name of the vector or position if it didn't have a name. Okay, question eight. Extract the characters X, Y, and Z using the dollar sign and extraction methods, but inside of this, uh, generate a logical vector that then does the extraction. Okay, so I give you a challenging output of Z, Y, um, and X. Um, this is true. You could just do a really long EP. Okay, one second, let me get get up there second element um i could technically just be like false 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 a lot until i get to the true 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 um but that's not as fun instead what i could do is um the values 1 through 26 
And then I could say r greater than or equal to 24. And that would work. And if I wanted it to output z, y, x, I would just have to reverse it. I don't know why I left that in there. I should probably make those x, y, and z next year. Um, so let me just leave it like that. I didn't actually say you should use reverse. Um, I don't think there's actually another way to do that with just trues and falses. Um, not without like really modifying this. So I could do like which, which would convert these positions into just the true positions. Uh, however, if I did that, I would no longer be doing an extraction with a logical vector. I'd be doing it with a numeric vector. And then once I had that numeric vector, I'd have to reverse it. So that would also do it, but that's horrendously convoluted. Um, but technically true does not, would not fulfill a logical vector requirement. That said, logical vectors probably should be avoided for directly doing um, extractions anywhere where missing data is possible. And we should always be probably considering that missing data is possible. Uh, the next one said assign rows to the fifth element in EP list. Um, so in this case, I have the answer already. Um, here are the current row names for Iris. Uh, it's just numbers. Um, here is me creating names for those. And I could actually overwrite Iris, which currently if I just print it, it looks like this. If I assign the row names to Iris, I've actually changed how that prints. So now it's got different numbers based upon what uh, this text was. So that's kind of what I'm having you do. I'm trying to get you to name the rows first, second, third, and fourth. Um, so this would be your output. Um, so if I wanted to do that, I would need to access this data. So I already kind of gave ourselves a little handy tool. Um, basing it upon the structure, I'm gonna have to actually assign to the attributes. So right now the attributes, the row names are one, two, three, and four. I am instead going to have to give them values first. Let's see, I'm just gonna copy that. Take out the and, press actual backspace. And now if I print that off, it should look like our example. Oop, gotta run it first. Then print it off and it should look like our example, which it does. So that's just a trick about row names is that you can assign to them. Same for column names. So I, I will frequently manipulate both row names and column names, usually giving it more interesting row names and column names that help me understand things. Like for instance, I could have uh, made like some sort of analysis of each of the values across the row. Um, so I could have used like paste O to do one, underscore two underscore three and if I do that I can have a little bit more informative names I don't know why I would do that in this context but I do it all the time for um, my like research because I'm often like trying to take my row um, or my like chromosome and position values squish them together into some sort of more meaningful name that allows me to understand what I'm looking at uh, without having to just be like humongous numbers that are hard to, to read and remember. Uh, so I believe this is the final question. It says extract the fifth element from EP list, however you wish. Um, so let's just do this one. Um, let's have already demonstrated this else. Uh, you know what, how about this? We'll, we'll do... Is this the fifth element? No, this was the fifth element. Uh, second alley. No. What is this? Uh, EP list is one, two, three, four, five, DF. Got it. <laughs> that took way too long. Um, DF. There it is. Um, all right, so I got DF now, um, however I wish, but then use row names and column names to extract the values, it is me. 
Um, so those are from column one and rows one, two, and three. But I say to use the, oh, dang, I messed this up. All right, one second, let me go run this. And then print this. Yeah, it would have been fun, but yeah, not the point. Uh, so the row names are going to be second, third, and fourth um, because I have multiple strings. I, I will need to kind of stick them together using the C function, which is just the easiest way to stick things together in R uh, into a single object as opposed to separate values. Oh my gosh, type lowercase h. All right, let's just test it out, see what it looks like. Okay, that works so far. I then need to refer to just that first column so I'm just going to, instead of using a C, I'm just gonna type in a uh, quotation mark because that is the same thing. It's just a length one as opposed to a length three character vector. And there it is. Uh, now R does automatically simplify that to a vector type object, just for the record. That's something that keeps coming up um, because if I then needed to like extract from this, um, like let's say I wanted that me, I would actually have to use a single square bracket with no comma because I've changed how the data was structured. So there you are. So still good, still good, cool. All right, um, next questions were about logical practice. Um, so the question is, if I have this class list object just a, again, a convoluted list. I then take the values one through three and I take the class list. This is clearly much more complex than the values one through three. That means that in order to combine them, it's gonna have to coerce them to a common data type. And so that means that one through three is going to be coerced into a list because the other would be crazy. How are you gonna convert a list into like a giant vector? Um, we could try it, let's see what happens. Unlist, that's the function to unlist the list. Okay, well, um, it's possible, but it is ugly. Uh, the much easier way is to just convert this into a list. So let's see what that looks like, as.list one through three. So instead of sticking it into one vector across a single container, it spreads it across three containers. I don't know why. This used to be a homework question, actually. And it's just such a strange behavior that I've always kind of thought it was worth pointing out. But honestly, it just confuses everybody because it's a very strange behavior and it's just hard to understand. Um, but yeah, that's what's going to happen is it's going to look just like our class list object, but instead now it has three additional uh, containers. Any unnamed containers have been shifted down uh, by three values. So it used to be presumably the second container is now the fifth container. Weird, right? Uh, list, on the other hand, is a function that creates lists. And so if I run this, this, each argument becomes a container. This is already a list, but it's still going to get placed within a container. So we're actually making this like an extra layer deep now. So this list has two layers, the first list, sorry, the first container containing one, two, and three, and then the second container just containing all of that data. And so I'd actually have to put, go into the second container. Like if I call the length, it's, it's length two uh, because it's got one, two containers. So it's placing a list within a list, a little bit convoluted. How do I extract the letter C? Um, presumably from glass, class list. Um, let's see, class list is right here. So I'll just type in class list and then that. Um, so that works by itself because it's the only value inside of that container. Uh, D is right here. So again, just copying that out. Now let me read this to you. So this one was extracting the contents of the fifth container. This one is extracting the contents of inside list wherever that container exists. It's kind of the power of numbering versus naming. Wherever that list, it'll get extracted. And then it's extracting the 
uh, contents inside of that list called one letter, which happens to just be the character one letter of D. Uh, value 25 is right here. So we can access that by following this guide, but then we'll have to go a little bit deeper. I really hate typing if you can't tell. Uh, so at this point, the first position would be 23. So for instance, if I just added 23 to the end of this, oh, I mean, sorry, one to the end of this, it would pull out the 23. That must mean this is two and this is three. So what's happening is this is a vector. I then have to use a vector style extraction tool to get the third position out. The next one says, how do I extract just the values 12 through 12 through 15? Well, let's go find out where those are. Let me just print off. It's been a while. Uh, 12 through 15 are right here. Um, so I'm going to have to go down the column across rows four through seven. Um, so to get to this data, it's just named DF1. Okay, there it is. Uh, so at this point, I could extract the first column and then go, what is it? Uh, four through seven. This is gonna get pretty wild because we have so many different options here. Um, I could have used names where available. The only other name available is <laughs> COL1. Okay, that also works. I could have simplified it to, oops, one. I could have simplified it to a one dimensional object first and then extracted the fourth through the 17th position. So note this is a vector now. So I don't need, to, or I can't actually use the comma now. Um, I could have done everything using positions. Is this, is this container two? Let me, let me just check. No. Three? No. This is why I prefer names. Four? Oh my gosh, just go look at it. Uh, it is container six. <laughs> six. Dang it. All right, six. There it is. Cool. Moving forward, I could then extract. Oh, if I really wanted to, I could continue to treat it like a list and extract the first container from the list, which is actually just the first column. Oh, I don't know what that is. Um, so there's that. And then finally, I now have a vector. So I have to go back to my vector extraction tool. So that's also technically feasible. So all of these doing the same thing, many different ways. That's why this section is a little bit confusing is there's just so many options. But the problem is some options are better in certain circumstances. Like if, if your stuff may be changing its name, this might be the best, but it means that it can't change order. On the other hand, if it always changes order, then this might be important. And honestly, what if it changes length as well? And I just always need the last three digits of that first column. So I could be like, all right, um, oh geez, what would I do? In row of all of this, minus three, two, three. Put that into parentheses <laughs> and then do the in row of all that. Ah, I, I can't get in row. I would have to use length, but rather than change length, I'll just change it to the data frame. Um, there we go, same thing. But now it's robust to even moving the data around um, or adding data to the, the, the data frames. Like if it was a taller data frame, this would still get those last three values from the column named call one. So it's kind of the difference between hard coding, like this is very hard coded, it's, or in certain ways, um, this is very soft coded in certain ways, but like the names are very specific. Um, so I guess if I really wanted it to just always be the sixth container and the uh, first value in there. I could do that. So many options, different strategies. You learn it through experience and practice and uh, just having new needs come up. Okay, 
Uh, extract 915 using just the names of elements and dollar sign. Um, 9 through 15, right there, it's that whole column. Uh, the names of elements and the dollar sign, easy enough, I've already done that, right there. Access the DF1 column, access the column one inside of DF, there you go. Uh, extract 9 through 15 using just the names and elements and that. Uh, I mean, I guess technically I said and that, so I could do this or I could flip the script and do um, this one was six, 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 and then there. So those both fulfill that outcome. Uh, extract nine through 15 using just the index of elements and that. So if I combine these concepts, typing just let me type what I want to type so now both of these are using the index position so that's what all of this was this is just index of elements the position in other words um, so I get the same answer and I'm only using double square brackets extract 9 through 10 uh, using one of the above methods and a logical vector Ooh, fun okay so I'm gonna just make it more fun and I'm gonna say uh, values less than 11 so this is going to extract all that data, compare it to the value 11, turning true, true, false, 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 which is the right length to extract just 9 and 10. Could you also have manually typed it in? Yes, but that's lame. Who wants to type that? True, true. What is it? False, 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 false. Also works. Not as fun. Extract the container with 23 and 30, 23 and 26 in it. Okay, right there. Uh, class list. So right now, uh, the output is not a list. Um, I can check that. It's an integer. And that's because this final extraction is what's called a recursive extraction. And it's going inside of the list. Um, if I want to get the container, I can just utilize the number uh, with a single square bracket. So that's the difference between pulling out the container and pulling out the contents of the container. So that's why I kind of word it that way. Um, Looks like we got one last big one. Set up a list object. The first element should be named allele list. I'm just gonna start typing. Uh, list and the first, I'm gonna put a line break because call it um, a new, do I give you the name for it? I'm just gonna say uh, Q10 for now. Okay, um, and I'm gonna close this and it's called allele list. All right, I don't know what that's gonna equal, so we'll just put a comma and keep moving. Oh, it does. Uh, first element is a length to list object. Oh man, it's gonna have a list inside. Pass Nolan, you're so mean. Um, containing with elements named locus one and locus two, I forgot my comma. Okay, so they're gonna do some stuff. Each element has a length to character vector containing either A, T, C, or G. Oh, let's just do this then. Okay, those are F. Those are length to character vectors. Uh, optional, select the alleles at random here. So, so that would work, um, but I say to select the alleles at random. So I'm going to use the sample function, um, which has the vectors to choose from. So we'll just make this A, T, C, G, um, and then that'll be the end. Uh, the size is how many items to choose. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, I do want to replace. So otherwise we would um, never have like two of the same. And I technically don't prohibit that. And I'm just checking this. Uh, one in 16 should be the same. So it took me a little bit to get there, but there it is. No, four and 16. Yeah. No, one in 16. Four and 16, got it, cool. <laughs> Um, and then I'll just repeat that for the second one. And then check to make sure that's working. Lovely. The second element is a length to numer uh, length 10 numeric vector of named sample ID. I think I probably meant named sample ID, not named of. Sample ID. So this should be sorted random positive integers less than 1 million. Okay. Um, so I say positive integers. I don't describe any sort of distribution. So I'm going to assume a uniform distribution. So R unif is the function for that. If you didn't know that, like you really just need to know one of the random function names and then all of them pull up this full list. Um, Oh, actually they don't. Uh, sorry. These are all just different version of uniform. So you'd have to have search for uniform distribution. Okay. Uh, so the uniform distribution is going to be from, it's going to be 10 values. It's going to be a minimum of positive integers. So minimum of one to max of 1 million. And I say it needs to be a, a positive integer. Um, so I could do this. How about this? Instead of doing our, so I, I could. Um, I would just need a round at this point. But that actually kind of throws off the um, like the the probability at the edges of the distribution because there's not as many values. I'd have to be like uh, 0 0.5 to 1 million and five. Uh, the much easier solution uh, is just to do one through one million, is that right? Yes, uh, size 10 and do not replace because I do say unique, um, but they do want it sorted. So all together that should give me what I want. Looking good and ready to go. Just double checking all of that. I've created an object. It didn't tell me how to name it. The first element is named allele list. Good. Uh, length two list object it is uh, with elements named locus one, locus one, and locus two, locus two. Uh, each element contains a length two character vector containing some nucleotides. And then the second element is a length 10 numeric vector named sample ID. Now I can check all of these things uh, lengthwise by just calling their name and then ca calculating their length. So this next section says use dollar sign to add an element to the output of part one. Um, it contains, so to do that, we'll just assign a value to a new name. Uh, it's gonna contain a data frame. Do I not say? what the name of it should be. Dang. Um, so if I want to like do DF1, I could, um, but I also could just give it a new position. So I could say length of Q10 plus one. And then I could assign data to that position. So I'm not gonna do that just yet because every time I assign to it, it'll just keep getting the object longer and longer enough to go keep remaking it. Um, so let's first uh, figure out what the data frame will be. Um, so we'll just call this uh, temp df and we'll make it using the data frame function unsurprisingly. It's going to contain 10 rows and four columns. All right. Columns are locus. Ooh, I'm just going to 
copy paste because I'm lazy. Right. Uh. 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 Haha. <laughs> Um, the rows are named this, so that's actually good because we're going to have to name things. Um, and then, uh, so to do that, so once we get these values, um, we'll be assigning row names. So this is the way that you assign row names. You call the row names function and you assign it um, values. So. Uh, we'll assign it sample underscore the number from sample ID. So that was Q10 sample ID. Does that work? It does. This won't work yet because temp DF hasn't been created. So let's come back to that. Um, use paste O and sample to fill each column with alleles from the appropriate allele list element. Optional alphabet ties the alleles at each locus. A then T instead of T then A for any sample or locus combination. All right, um, let's try that. Oh boy, I got creative here. Um, I think this is a simulation on um, like having some parents and then crossing those parents. Um, so if each locus is 1A, 1B, 2A, and 2B, it will be created from uh, sampling of these objects. So 1A, locus one, sample that. I'm going to do how many rows? I want 10 rows, so that will be a size of 10. Um, I do want to replace. Um, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to draw 10 times from a length to object, but also I, I, that's just how meiosis works. And if I check that out, that looks right. So that is the first sampling of the locus, second sampling of the locus. I'll have to change this one so that it's sampling the other locus. And sampling the other locus. If I check that out, and I go look at my allele list. Uh, if these are representing individual samples, um, so this is like a, a individual uh, with different genotypes across each locus, then this would be um, possible for locus A, this would be possible for locus B, and that all makes sense then. So these are Gs, Locus B2 couldn't have contributed those, but uh, Locus T does. Sorry, Locus 2 <laughs> um, does have Ts. Cool, so that all worked. At this point, then I am naming them, showing that what that looks like, and there we go. Now I say alphabetize the alleles at each locus as an option. That's a little bit trickier to do. Um, what I would probably want to do in that situation is either write a loop um, or really rearrange how I'm doing this. Um, so definitely possible. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna really go through that. Um, I'll just write a loop, it's not hard. Um, definitely wouldn't have expected any of y'all to be doing this at this time. But anyways, the, the final step would be to add in that uh, temporary data frame. And so now if I print off Q10, I can see like this first sampling um, at this point, I would need to start uh, this process for writing a for loop. So alphabetize each locus. Okay. Um, so if I'm alphabetizing each locus, then I'm going to go for I in one through in row of temp DF. This is going to loop across each row. It's the easiest way to do it. Cur row. It's a bit hacky, but don't worry about it. Um, so right now I'm going to use I to extract, but I doesn't exist yet. So very commonly I will be debugging for loops by just manually creating um, the I value. 
uh, the iterated value it doesn't have to be I I'm just using I here so for example here I'm doing my current row of the first one um, from this I am going to alphabetize the first two values by sorting them if I sort them and then reassign them it tells me that I cannot do that because it's not currently a data frame and that's true um, so I could unlist it would be one option I could also unlist it here uh, so why don't I unlist it here and that way I don't have to change anything else so when I do that instead of being a data frame it's now a vector uh, corresponding to the, that single row I am then extracting that which has rearranged my letters here repeat that for the second Ooh. I just press control Z because I pressed the wrong hotkey and then we'll do this next one you may think this also could have been automated because what if I had many many loci definitely could have written a loop within a loop that was something like for J and let's do K. I hate doing I and K because they look or I and J because they look so similar. Um, one through in row of or length of cur row divided by two. So this would be for a diploid species only. So if I wanted to change the ploidy, I would need to change that calculation. Okay. So if that was the situation, I would just have to change this to math. Um, so instead of one through two, it would be one through two plus, yeah, plus K minus one times two. I believe that would do it. I have to give some order of operations there though. Okay, so if K is one, let's just check out that math. If k is 1 and I run this math, it becomes 1 and 2. If k is 2, it becomes 3 and 4. So I got the math right. I know, it's a miracle. All right, at this point, it should work however many loci there are. Um, is this correct? Yes, and if cur row was say four, uh, like six values long, so diploid, uh, it would have a value of three. So that would be because that'd be six divided by two. So this would go through three. So that should work, um, and we're good to go. Oh, and I have to then put the value of cur row in back into it. Um, so once all of that cur row has been analyzed, then I'll just reverse this. Probably easier just for me to have typed that out but hey I don't like typing so I can help it um, and then I just add it back in so let me generate these change the row names run that script check out the results and there we go they've been alphabetized easy peasy well no that was pretty advanced right like I mean that's something that takes some practice and it's you know, it's just one of those things you encounter this problem and you get better at solving it. And the next time you encounter it, it solves as fast as this one. Um, maybe not as fast as this one. Maybe that takes a few attempts to try and do this. But that's exactly how I learned to do all of this is just went through it and kept trying and learning new things. All right. Hope that helped. Um, I will. Uh, I'm probably not going to post this, but um, I, I hope that helped. Reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.